Hi, I'm Dr. Carly Wilbur, Medical Director for PSI and Attending Physician at University Hospital's Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. We're here today to talk about maximizing safety and prevention in the age of COVID-19. Today's agenda will include a pretest, some COVID fast facts, a cute mnemonic from Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, the A's, B's, C's, D's of COVID-19 safety and prevention. We will cover the preventative measures that most experts agree will keep you safe from getting COVID-19, and then we'll have a post-test and see how much we've learned today. Here's a sample of the pretest. Some of the questions include, true or false, COVID-19 is the 19th coronavirus to be discovered. The novel coronavirus is fatal X percent of the time in most cases. We'll talk about the symptoms of COVID-19, which are true, which are not, uh, whether or not masks are actually helpful in stopping the spread of coronavirus, and what we know about current cures and treatments for COVID. We'll cover all of this information and more in the coming slides. COVID-19 fast facts. While there remains some debate about how the virus entered the human population, we do know that the first recorded case of coronavirus occurred in Wuhan, China at the end of last year. It's called COVID-19 because it's a coronavirus infectious disease, disease discovered in 2019. In terms of contagion, to date, our species has not experienced a more virulent or contagious germ. We've all had or seen flu or strep, and part of the barrage of questions your doctor has for you in the office now includes what exposures you've had to COVID. With COVID-19, a person can enter a space where a contagious person stood hours ago and still be at risk. Symptoms can be tricky, since not everyone with this coronavirus exhibits symptoms. Indicators of infection run the gamut. Fever, weakness, headache, loss of taste and smell, cough, chest discomfort, difficulty breathing, abdominal pain, appetite loss, diarrhea, painful rashes, stroke, respiratory and cardiac failure. Mortality rate ranges from one study to the next. In general population, death due to mild coronavirus infection is unlikely and hovers around 1%. However, data from patients who got sick enough to require an ICU stay show a death rate of almost 30%. What we don't know because of insufficient availability of testing for the general population is how many asymptomatic patients are positive for COVID. Tests for the COVID antigen looking for current infection include a swab up the nose and they can take anywhere from 15 minutes to three days to report results. These tests can pr produce false negatives if the swab didn't collect an adequate sample from deep in the posterior oropharynx. Antibody tests look to identify patients who have had previous resolved coronavirus infection. These are done through a blood draw, and they can result in false positive test results if the test recognizes an older coronavirus antibody from a previous cold and not the novel co coronavirus-19. Cures do not exist at this time. A vaccine is at least several months away, and there's no definitive proof to date that serum from COVID survivors will certainly help current patients prevail. If you see something on the internet that claims to prevent or cure COVID-19, don't fall for it. Drawing on best practice guidelines issued by experts at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, this easy mnemonic offers an easy to remember protocol for COVID safety. A, always wear a mask. Masking covers the nose and mouth where respiratory droplets are produced and inhaled. Wearing a mask protects you and those around you. B, be aware of coronavirus symptoms. Shortly, we'll cover the most common presenting symptoms of COVID-19. The most important thing to know is that if you feel sick, don't try to muscle through it. Instead, stay home and keep to your own space. C, clean your hands and your space. We will discuss proper hand washing techniques today and review the importance of using hand sanitizer when soap and water aren't readily available. As much as possible, try not to put your hands on commonly touched surfaces. D, distance physically, but not socially. Ideally, putting six feet of, of physical distance between you and your neighbor optimizes your safety. 
And while we need to allow for a good perimeter around our physical selves, we must also work hard to stay connected to each other emotionally. With that overview, we can now focus on the details of everyday interventions that will be in place to help keep teachers and students safe in the fall as schools reopen. The first preventative measure we'll talk about is how to recognize symptoms of coronavirus. Most places of business, including retail stores, warehouses, doctor's offices, and camps are requiring employees to demonstrate normal temperatures before entry. At medical facilities, patients and visitors must also document a lack of fever before being granted access to the building. Because setting up a hard stop to check everyone's temperature during high traffic times, like the start of the school day, would create a bottleneck that is counterproductive to social distancing, it might sometimes be prudent to work on the honor system and have employees and students check their temperatures at home before arrival to the property. Unfortunately, this practice relies on everyone having a thermometer in their home, which isn't realistic. If the fever is 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, practicing an abundance of caution is advised and staying home will be required. When returning to school after an episode of illness that included fever, the newest CDC criteria include a fever-free status for at least 24 hours. The next preventative measure, stay home if you feel sick. Keeping your distance from others, especially when experiencing symptoms of coronavirus, will help protect other people. The list of symptoms of COVID is so broad, however, that it leaves little room for interpretation. Like if I stayed home every time I woke up and still felt tired, I'd never leave the house. People experiencing a few of these symptoms or any that are listed in the first column should isolate themselves until they are feeling better. And if fever was one of the symptoms for another 24 hours after they're feeling better. For those of you who can't see the slide, that first column includes fever, chills, coughing, chest pain, difficulty breathing, and sore throat. Also weakness, fatigue, pink eye, diarrhea, and just generalized malaise not feeling well. Yeah, that one's gross. <laughs> Here is what a sneeze looks like when captured on film. This is how we'll demonstrate the importance of social distancing, the next preventative measure to cover. Keeping six feet of space between you and your neighbor will help protect you from their respiratory droplets, whether those are being projected by sneezing, coughing, talking, or just breathing. While shouting does tend to produce more spittle than baseline speech, both can contribute to contagion. Indoor spaces present a higher risk due to recirculation of air and the particles within that air. Outdoor spaces are safer in that a breeze may be able to carry respiratory droplets away from you. Even indoors, keeping windows open to increase ventilation should help decrease COVID contagion. This video clearly demonstrates the exponential effect of triggering closely neighboring items and starkly contrasts that same trigger with items that are distanced from one another. A study out of Hong Kong in May conducted on hamsters concluded that masking can reduce transmission of COVID by over 60%. There's no denying that masks are uncomfortable and hot and probably make us touch our faces more than normal, but they have been proven to prevent the spread of this very contagious illness, especially in situations where one-on-one -on -one instruction or necessitated close physical proximity makes it impossible to appropriately socially distance wearing a mask offers a layer of protection against this airborne virus. Wearing a mask isn't as simple as it sounds. There is a proper process and a good fit is required. Washing hands before putting on your mask means only clean hands are touching your face, which reduces the chances of COVID infection. Likewise, washing hands after removing your mask means any germs contracted on the surface of the mask will not remain on your hands. A good fitting mask 
one that does not have gaps and wide open spaces between the surface of your face and the fabric of the mask will protect you and others better than a loose, baggy one. Wearing a mask that covers your nose and mouth provides more comprehensive coverage than pulling down the mask below the nostrils since respiratory droplets are released and inhaled through both the mouth and the nose. This video demonstrates proper application and removal of a disposable mask with ear loops. Hold the mask with the outer layer out and pleats folding down. The outer layer is usually colored and should be away from your face when donned. Pull to open the pleats. Press the metal nose piece to the bridge of your nose to shape the mask to your face. Pull the ear loops over your ears. Press the nose piece to your face one more time to ensure a secure fit. When you are ready to remove your mask, make sure your hands are clean and pull the ear loops back over your ears. Avoid touching other parts of the mask to prevent contamination. Hold the mask with the out. Now this next video offers information about how and when to use reusable cloth mask. like this is like wearing your pants like this. It's about as protective, practical, and attractive. No offense, Justin Bieber. Now, what about wearing a face shield as protection against COVID-19? Ideally, to provide full coverage, a face shield should curve around the sides of the face and extend below the chin. There are some benefits of wearing a face shield versus a mask. These include less of a sensation of overheating from rebreathing. For patients with underlying respiratory difficulties or claustrophobia, a face shield might be more comfortable than a mask. There's a lower incidence of acne associated with mask wearing, affectionately referred to as maskne. Face shields don't tend to fog up one's glasses the way masks can. Face shields are impermeable, so while some particles might pass through the fabric of a mask, they can't permeate the plastic of a face shield. Face shields are easier to clean between uses, a simple swipe instead of running the washing machine. In general, it's easier to talk through a face shield than through a mask. Masks don't fit well, I'm, I'm sorry, masks that don't fit well can roam around the face and require constant readjusting, which violates the don't touch your face rule. The clear plastic of a face shield makes it easier for hearing, import, hearing impaired patients to read lips as compared to someone who's wearing a mask. And for students learning a foreign language, the visibility of their instructor's mouth through the face shield is an advantage over them wearing a mask. So what about using a face shield instead of a mask to protect against COVID-19? Ideally, to provide full coverage, a face shield should curve around the sides of the face and extend below the chin. There are some benefits of wearing a face shield versus a mask. These include face shields have less of a sensation of overheating from rebreathing. For patients with underlying respiratory difficulties or claustrophobia, it may be more comfortable to wear a face shield than a mask. Face shields have a lower incidence of acne associated with mask wearing, affectionately referred to as maskne. 
Face shields don't tend to fog up one's glasses the way masks can. Face shields are impermeable, so while some particles might pass through the fabric of a mask, they can't permeate the plastic of a face shield. Face shields are easier to clean between uses, a simple swipe instead of running the washing machine. In general, it is easier to talk through a face shield than through a mask. Masks that don't fit well can roam around the face and require constant readjusting, which violates the don't touch your face rule. The clear plastic of a face shield makes it easier for hearing impaired patients to read lips as compared with that of someone wearing a mask. And for students learning a foreign language, the visibility of their instructor's mouth through the face shield is an advantage over them wearing a mask. During one-on-one -on -one instruction for children with special needs or even in a group setting with developmentally appropriate younger children, face shields might offer benefits that include the child being able to pay closer attention when the instructor's mouth is visible and being able to use social cues, including facial expression, when the face is more readily observable. There are children for whom wearing a mask is unsafe or impractical. Those with marked physical or intellectual delays or patients who don't have the coordination to remove the mask if needed should not wear masks. Children with sensory input disorders for whom a mask may be intolerable or those with deformities of the face that would make the mask ill-fitting may benefit from the option of wearing a face shield instead. There are some drawbacks as well, however. Risks of face shields as compared to masks include, while masks do a good job of protecting those around the wearer, face shields protect the wearer more than those around them. Masks tend to absorb many of the respiratory droplets that emerge from the mouth and nose, and face shields don't offer that protection. These droplets can escape more easily from a face shield than from a mask. Face shields are not safe to use during athletic play due to an increased risk of injury. While face shields can substitute for a mask in some cases, for healthcare professionals in contact with ill patients, the most protective getup still requires wearing a mask, even with a face shield in place. So when is a face shield appropriate to use? Individuals with a medical contraindication to wearing a mask might benefit from wearing a face shield. In situations where students need to see the instructor's mouth, either for pronunciation of words or for children with learning differences or developmental challenges, a mask may interfere with optimal learning. In these cases, a face shield's benefit may outweigh the risk. The next preventative measure we'll talk about is washing hands. Data indicates that COVID is not absorbed through the skin. The only way that getting this germ on your hands will get you sick is if you then use those hands to touch the mucous membranes, eyes, nose, and mouth on your face. This risk can be limited when the hands are kept clean. Because COVID-19 has a lipid outer layer, soap destroys this germ. So does alcohol, which is why using hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol content is helpful as well. Washing the hands properly will help protect you from contracting and spreading this dangerous germ. Making sure that the hands are washed before and after food preparation, before you touch your or your child's face, after coming into contact with public or high touch surfaces, before and after providing care to someone needing physical assistance like a child or an elderly individual, after contact with animals, after using the restroom, and after using a tissue to blow your nose, to cough, or to sneeze. Here's a video about the importance of washing hands and how to do it right. You know that the best way to prevent the spread of coronavirus is to wash your hands. To wash your hands. Do, 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 do. Wash your hands. But why? It's because soap, regular soap, fancy honeysuckle soap, artisan peppermint soap, just any soap absolutely annihilates viruses like the coronavirus. Here's how. This is what a virus like coronavirus looks like. It's a bit of material surrounded by a coating of proteins and fat. Viruses easily stick to places like your hands, but when you rinse your hands with just water, it rushes right over the virus. That's because that layer of fat makes the virus behave kind of like a drop of oil. You can see it happening in this demonstration. Oils are just liquid fats. What happens when you pour oil into water? It floats. It doesn't mix. But add soap, and suddenly that fatty oil dissolves into the water. 
That's because inside, soap has two-sided molecules. One end of the molecule is attracted to water, the other end to fat. So when the soap molecules come in contact with water and fat, these dual attractions literally pull the fat apart, surrounding the oil particles and dispersing them through the water. Let's go back to our coronavirus molecule with that layer of fat holding everything together. When it interacts with soap, bam, that fat gets pulled out by the soap. Soap literally pulls apart and demolishes these viruses. And then the water rinses the harmless leftover shards of virus down the drain. But, and you know where I'm going with this, it takes time for this effect to happen. 20 seconds to be specific. To show why, we ordered this lotion that mimics viruses and their fatty layers. It glows under a UV light. If you just rinse your hands under regular water, nothing comes off. If you wash with soap for just five seconds or 10 seconds, your hands are still covered. The virus is still there, able to get you and others sick. But 20 full seconds, now the soap is actually destroying the virus. Hand sanitizer works too, because it's mostly alcohol. And alcohol works in a somewhat similar way to soap, breaking down that fatty layer. You need a high concentration of alcohol to make that work. The CDC recommends hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol. But even with 60% alcohol, the CDC recommends using soap if you can. If your hands are sweaty or dirty when you use the sanitizer, that can dilute it and diminish its effectiveness. As for soap, just any old soap works. You don't need soap marketed as antibacterial even. The FDA says skip it. There's no proof it's any more effective. Just be sure to wash your hands for 20 seconds. That's happy birthday twice. Happy birthday, dear, I guess me. Or the chorus to Lizzo's Truth Hurts. Straight to my face. Or Prince. Raspberry Beret. Or Eminem. Go, go, only go. Or even Dolly. Jolie, Jolie, Jolie. Just as long as it's 20 seconds. And you're using the ultimate virus annihilator, soap. Next preventative measure, limit the spray. To limit the forced spray of respiratory droplets through the air, please be sure to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing or coughing. Using your hand is likely to result in the spread of germs once you use that same hand to touch the next surface. Using the elbow of your sleeve or a tissue as a barrier is much safer. Toss the tissue in the trash when you're done and, as you know, wash your hands. The next preventative measure is using gloves. While at first medical experts presumed that the novel coronavirus could be contagious off of surfaces, more and more evidence now points to it being carried in respiratory droplets. So while wearing gloves at all times is not necessary, using gloves still can be helpful if they are used correctly. Wearing gloves to the store and then using those same gloved hands to touch the shopping cart, the products on the shelves, and then your phone screen, which then touches your face, hasn't really saved you from any exposure. Gloves are not necessary for everyday activities. It's important to remember that if you do need to wear gloves, you must wash your hands with soap and water after removing the gloves. According to the CDC, using gloves will spare your hands direct exposure to germs on contaminated surfaces. So wearing gloves while cleaning and disinfecting countertops and doorknobs is wise. Similarly, when caring for a patient with known COVID-19 or any contagious illness, employing barriers like gloves are a good protective measure specifically when coming into contact with bodily fluids like mucus, blood, urine, stool, saliva, and phlegm. However, gloves are not helpful when grocery shopping and are not necessary for using an ATM or a gas pump. school aid children will not gain any protection from wearing gloves all day in the classroom, in the gym, or on the field. For all of these situations, washing the hands after contact with community surfaces is suggested. And if you don't work in a hospital or a clinic or for a sanitation company, it's unlikely that gloves are necessary for your job. This video offers instruction on the proper donning and doffing of gloves. First thing, examine the gloves before putting them on to be sure there are no holes or cuts in them. A best practice, don't wear gloves over jewelry with sharp edges that could cut or puncture the gloves. Most gloves are pretty durable but put them on carefully to ensure they don't tear. This is important. When removing the gloves, 
carefully remove them by the cuff rather than the fingers and turn them inside out as you remove them. Remember, don't touch the outside of the gloves with your fingers when removing them. Dispose of them in the garbage. Wash hands thoroughly afterwards. Thank you and stay safe and healthy out there. First, the next preventative measure is about how to clean surfaces. First, a few definitions. Cleaning is the process of removing dirt. Disinfecting eliminates some germs with the use of chemicals. Sanitizing aims to vastly reduce the number of germs on a surface. Using approved disinfecting solutions, frequent cleaning of commonly used surfaces can help reduce the spread of COVID. In a school setting, this would include sanitizing desks, countertops, doorknobs and drawer handles, lab and gym equipment, computer keyboards, hands-on learning items, faucet handles, toilet flushers, phones, and in early childhood centers, toys. The American Academy of Pediatrics does not recommend that children participate in cleaning with any harsh chemicals. Some surfaces require more frequent attention than others, and if classes are moving in and out of the weight room or the lab at school, these surfaces should be wiped down thoroughly between groups. At home, regular disinfection of some of these same commonly touched surfaces like bathrooms, kitchen counters, and faucets are intuitive. Also, consider parts of your home that are touched by people who don't live there, like the mailbox and the doorbell. It's time for our post-test. Let's see these same questions again and figure out what we've learned today. Question number one. True or false, COVID-19 is the 19th coronavirus to be discovered. I'll give you a minute. The statement is false. COVID stands for Coronavirus Disease of 2019, since the first case presented at the end of last year. Previous coronaviruses include SARS and MERS, both serious respiratory diseases and other milder germs that are known to cause the common cold. This virus is much more contagious and aggressive, however, than any previous coronavirus. Next question. Question number two wants to know what percentage of the time coronavirus is fatal. Anybody know? The answer is A, less than 3% of the time. In the general population, COVID-19 fatality rate is low, about 1%. But compare this to the seasonal flu, whose fatality rate is less than 0.1%, and that still managed to kill about 34,000 people in the U.S. during the 2018-19 to flu season. So far, with over 4 million cases of COVID in the U.S. and just over 150,000 deaths, that's what we're seeing in our country. COVID appears to be particularly dangerous in the elderly population, whose death rate can reach 10% when only patients 85 years of age and older are counted. But if you think only the elderly can catch COVID-19, look to the recent statistics that show equal numbers of infection in almost every age bracket, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and reports of strokes in previously healthy young adults who got sick with this novel coronavirus. As we expand testing to include screening of individuals without symptoms, we will likely find many more cases of mild COVID illness and the fatality rate will drop even further. However, when the total number of cases in the country is over 4 million, that 1% really adds up. Question three, symptoms of COVID-19 include, let's see who was paying attention. Almost this whole list, except for vision loss and hair loss. Although if the stress of coronavirus is making you tear your hair out and scratch out your eyes, I suppose maybe. In all seriousness, all of these symptoms have been reported with COVID patients other than the hair loss and the vision loss. We can't now predict who is going to suffer from which symptoms and we can't predict how severe they're going to be. Next question. True or false, wearing a mask makes COVID less likely to spread. Please tell me you got this one right. This statement is true because COVID-19 is a germ that is spread by respiratory droplets wearing something, whether it's a mask or a face shield that puts a barrier between you and the outside world will protect you from droplets in the air. When one party uses proper protection, the risk of contagion is reduced somewhat, but when both parties have their mouths and noses covered, 
As this drawing illustrates, the droplet spread is greatly reduced and therefore the chance of catching COVID is also greatly reduced. Wearing a mask is not a political statement. It's a smart move that relies on demonstrated scientific evidence. Question five, current effective cures for COVID include, and then there are some listed. It doesn't matter because none of them are true. Sorry, spoiler. There is currently no known cure for COVID-19. Because it's a virus, antibacterial drugs like antibiotics won't be effective against it. Some success with an antiviral medication named remdesivir has been reported, but to date there is no reliable method of reversing the negative, negative effects of this powerful virus. The most we can hope for is not to get it in the first place. True or false, gloves are necessary for tasks like grocery shopping. Nope. The statement is false. Gloves are not necessary for everyday activities. In fact, wearing gloves when not essential is wasteful of necessary personal protective equipment, and it's unnecessarily uncomfortable. We talked about wearing gloves when using harsh chemicals for cleaning and disinfecting, when handling bodily fluids while performing care of an ill patient, or when you must touch a commonly used public surface and you don't have hand sanitizer available to wash up afterwards. Otherwise, gloves are not recommended routinely. Next question, true or false, COVID-19 is equally contagious indoors and outdoors. I'll give you a minute. This statement is false. The open air of an outdoor setting, along with the possibility of for more space for social distancing and better airflow than an indoor venue, all help to reduce the spread of respiratory droplets. In addition, the UV rays of the sun can help sterilize some germs as well. Does that mean being in the sunshine eliminates all risk of contagion? No, but it's preferable to an indoor setting. Other heat sources like a hair dryer are not reliable methods of deactivating the COVID-19 germ. Outdoor play while socially distanced and properly masked is not only safe, but encouraged. This is a big one. Name all the methods we have of reducing the spread of COVID-19. Here they come. There are proven methods of infection reduction, and these include everything we covered here today. Keeping a safe distance, covering your mouth and nose with a mask or face shield, washing your hands, particularly before and after touching commonly used surfaces, keeping your hands away from your eyes, nose, and mouth, using the right chemicals to clean commonly touched surfaces, coughing or sneezing into the elbow, and wearing gloves, but only when they're medically necessary. It's interesting to note that with all of the expensive things that people are looking to buy for schools, different filters for ACs, UV rays, all these things, it's the three cheapest and easiest things that we can do is to wear a mask, wash our hands, and keep our distance. So in conclusion, remember your ABCD, always wear a mask. Be aware of COVID symptoms and stay home if you're experiencing these symptoms. C for clean your hands and your space. D for distance physically, but not socially. Keep your distance from others, specifically six feet if you can. Wash your hands. Sneeze or cough into your elbow. Go ahead and wash your hands some more. Wear a mask in public regardless of what it's made of and make sure that it covers your mouth and nose. Wear gloves when you're using harsh cleaning products or handling bodily fluids, but remember they're not necessary for everyday activities. Protect yourself and protect others. Don't touch your face, specifically your eyes, nose, and mouth. Oh, and wash your hands. Thank you for your time and attention. Stay safe, everybody.